Ah, uh, yes. Hello, and welcome back to our dramatic reading of His Majesty's Dragon, book one of the Temeraire series by Naomi Novik. And when we last left you, <laughs> a strand of dust was flying into my mouth. No, uh, where we last left you, Lawrence was riding atop Temeraire, and they were going to relieve an injured dragon coming inbound over the coast of England after a skirmish, I believe, a skirmish with some French forces. It'll be the first action that both Lawrence and Temeraire have seen as part of the aerial corps, and they're just about three hours away, as it says where I pick up. The three hours were nearly up by the chronometer, and it was time to begin preparing to give support to the injured dragon. Maximus was perhaps half an hour behind them, and Temeraire would have to carry Victoriatus alone until the regal copper caught up. Mr. Granby, Lawrence said as he latched himself back into his normal position at the base of the neck. Let us clear the back, all the men below, save for the signal ensign and the forward lookouts. Very good, sir, Granby said, nodding, and turned at once to arrange it. Lawrence, worked, uh, Lawrence watched him work with mingled satisfaction and irritation. For the first time in the past week, Granby had been going about his duties without the air of stiff resentment, and Lawrence could easily perceive the effects. The speed of nearly every operation improved. Myriad small defects in harness placement and crew positioning, previously invisible to his own inexperienced eye, now corrected. The atmosphere among the men more relaxed. All the many ways in which an excellent first lieutenant could improve the life of a crew and Granby had, was now proven capable of them all. But that only made his early ad earlier attitude more regrettable. Uh, volunt uh, Volatilis turned and came flying back towards them only shortly after they had cleared the top. James pulled him about and cupped his hands around his mouth to call to Lawrence, I've sighted them two points to the north and twelve degrees down. You'll need to drop to come up under them, for I don't think he can get any more elevation. He signaled the numbers with hand gestures as he spoke. Very good, Lawrence called back through his speaking trumpet and had the signal ensign wave a confirmation with flags. Temeraire was large enough now that Volley could not get so close as to make verbal communication certain. Temeraire stooped into a dive at his quick signal, and very soon Lawrence saw a speck on the horizon rapidly enlarge into a group of dragons. Victoriatus was in, is instantly identifiable. He was larger by half than either of the two yellow reapers struggling to keep him aloft. Through the injur though the injuries were already under thick bandages applied by his crew, blood had seeped through, showing the slash marks where the dragon had evidently taken blows from the enemy beasts. The Parnassian's own claws were unusually large and stained with blood as well, his jaws also. The smaller dragons below looked crowded, and there was no one aboard the injured dragon but his captain and perhaps half a dozen men. Signal the two supporters. Prepare to stand aside, Lawrence said. The young signal ensign waved the colored flags in rapid sequence, and a prompt acknowledgment came back. Temeraire had already flown around the group and positioned himself properly. He was just below and to the back of the second supporting dragon. Temeraire, are you quite ready? Lawrence called. They had practiced this maneuver in training, but it would be unusually difficult to carry it out here. The injured dragon was barely beating his wings, and his eyes were half shut with pain and exhaustion. The two supporters were clearly worn out themselves. They would have to drop out of the way smoothly, and Tamaraire darted in very quickly to avoid having Victoriatus collapse into a deadly plummet that would be impossible to arrest. "'Yes, please let us hurry. They look so very tired,' Tamaraire said, glancing back. His muscles were tightly gathered. They had matched the other's pace. Nothing more could be gained by waiting. "'Signal! Exchange positions on Lead Dragon's mark,' Lawrence said. The flags waved. The acknowledgment came. Then on both sides of the, for of, the of the foremost of the two supporting dragons, the red flags went out and then were swapped for green.' The rear dragon dropped and peeled aside swiftly as Temeraire lunged. But the forward dragon went a little too slowly, his wings stuttering, and Victoriatus began to tilt forward as the reaper tried to descend away and make room. Dry, dive, damn you, dive, Lawrence roared at the top of his lungs. The smaller dragon's lashing tail was dangerously near Temeraire's head, and they could not move into place. The reaper gave up the maneuver and simply folded his wings. He dropped out of the way like a stone. So he wanted that dragon that's in front of them for trying to get under Victoriatus. It just went, he's like, get out of the way. I don't need you to maneuver or, or slightly veer off. Get out, you know. Um, 
I'm dropped like a stone. Tamarere, you must get you must get him up a little so you can come forward. Lauren shouted again, crouched low against the neck. Victoriatus' hindquarters had settled over Tamarere's shoulders instead of further back, and the great belly was less than three feet overhead, barely kept up by the injured dragon's waning strength. Temeraire showed with a bob of his head that he had heard and understood. He beat up rapidly at an angle, pushing the slumping Parnassian back up higher through sheer strength, then snapped his wings closed. A brief, sickening drop, drop then his wings fanned out again with a single great thrust. Temeraire had himself properly positioned, and Victoriatus came heavily down upon them again. Lawrence had a moment of relief. Then Temeraire cried out in pain. He turned and saw in horror that in his confusion and agony, Victoriatus was scrambling at ta uh, scrabbling at Tamerere, and the great claws had raked Tamerere's shoulder and side. Above, muffled, he heard the other captain shouting. Victoriatus stopped, but Tamerere was already bleeding, and straps of the harness were hanging loose and flapping in the wind. They were losing elevation rapidly. Tamerere was struggling to keep flying under the other dragon's weight. Lawrence fought with his carabiners, yelling at the signal ensign to let the men below know. The boy scrambled part way down the neck strap, waving the white and red flag wildly. In a moment, Lawrence gratefully saw Granby climbing up with two other men to bandage the wounds, reaching the gashes more quickly than he could. He stroked Temeraire, called reassurance to him in a voice that struggled not to break. Temeraire did not spare the effort to turn and reply, but bravely kept beating his wings. <laughs> though his head was drooping with the strain. Not deep, Granby shouted from where they worked and to pad the gashes, and Lawrence could breathe and think clearly again. The harness was shifting upon Tamerere's back. Aside from the great deal of lesser rigging, uh, the main shoulder strap had been nearly cut through, saved only by the wires that ran through it. But the leather was parting, and as soon as it went, the wires would break under the strain of all the men and gear currently riding below. All of you, take off your harnesses and pass them to me, Lawrence said to the signal ensign and the lookouts. The three boys were the only ones left above besides him. Take a good grip on the main harness and get your arms and legs tucked underneath. The leather of the personal harnesses was thick, solidly stitched, well-oiled, and the carabiners were solid steel, not quite as strong as the main harness, but nearly so. He slung the three harnesses over his arm and clambered along the back strap to the broader part of the shoulders. Granby and the two midwingmen were still working on the injuries to Tamerere's side. They spared him a puzzled look, and Lawrence realized they could not see the nearly severed shoulder band. It was hidden from their view by Tamerere's foreleg. There was no time to call them forward to help in any case. The band was rapidly beginning to give way. He could not come at it normally. If he tried to put his weight on any of the rings along the shoulder band, it would certainly break at once. Working as quickly as he could under the roaring pressure of the wind, he hooked two of the harnesses together by their carabiners, then looped them around the backstrap. Tamerere, stay as level as you can, he shouted. Then clinging to the ends of the harness, he unlocked his own carabiners and climbed carefully out onto the shoulder, held by nothing more than his grip on the leather. Granby was shouting something at him. The wind was tearing it away, and he could not make out the words. Lawrence tried to keep his eyes fixed on the green straps. The ground below was the beautiful, fresh green of early spring, strangely calm and pastoral. They were low enough that he could see white dots of sheep. Oh, whoops. Hopefully that's not going to... Oh, sorry about that. He could see white dots of sheep. Um... Uh... He was in arm's reach now with a hand that shook slightly. He latched the first of the carabiner, first carabiner of the third loose harness onto the ring just above the cut, the second onto the ring just below. He pulled on the straps, throwing his weight against them as much as he dared. His arms ached and trembled as if, it, as if with high fever. Inch by inch, he drew the small harness tighter, until at last... The portion between the carabiners was the same size as the cut portion of the band, which was taking much of its weight. The leather stopped fraying away. Now, if you had trouble following all that, trust me, I did too. But the essence of it is, is by borrowing or taking the, the uh, harnesses and the carabiners of three other crewmen, he was able to kind of stitch them together and then make them into one big long strap to, to, to make up for the ripped straps that were ripped by um, the other wounded dragon's claws. So he just replaced this fraying strap with like a makeshift huge strap out of the three harnesses to wrap around and connect the two severed ends. So that's at least what I'm picturing, uh, having heard this a couple times. He looked up. Granby was slowly climbing towards him, snapping onto the rings as he came. 
Now that the harness was in place, the strain was not an immediate danger, so Lawrence did not wave him off, but only shouted, Call up Mr. Fellows, the harness master, and pointed to the spot. Granby's eyes widened as he came over the foreleg and saw the broken strap. As Granby turned to signal below for help, bright sunlight abrupt, abruptly fell, on, fell full on his face. Victoriatus was shuddering above them, wings convulsing, and the Parnassian's chest came heavily down on Tamarare's back. Tamarare staggered in midair, one shoulder dipping under the blow, and Lawrence was sliding along the linked harness straps, wet palms giving him no purchase. The green world was spinning beneath him, and his hands were already tired and slick with sweat. His grip was failing. Lawrence, hold on, Tamarare called. Head turned to look back at him. His muscles and wing joints were shifting as he prepared to snatch Lawrence out of the air. You must not let him fall, Lawrence shouted, horrified. Tamarare could not try to catch him except by tipping Victoriatus off his back and sending the Parnassian to his death. Tamarare, you must not! Lawrence, Tamarare cried again, his claws flexing, his eyes wide and distressed, and his head waved back and forth in denial. Lawrence could see he did not mean to obey. He struggled to keep hold of the leather straps, to try and climb up. If he fell, if it was not only his own life which would be forfeit, but the injured dragon and all his crew still aboard. Granby was there suddenly, seizing Lawrence's harness in both hands. Lock on to me, he shouted. Lawrence saw at once what he meant. With one hand still clinging to the linked harnesses, he locked his loose carabiners onto the rings of Granby's harness, then transferred his grip to Granby's chest straps. Then the midwing reached them. Then the midwing men reached them. All at once there were many strong hands grabbing at them, drawing Lawrence and Granby back up together to the main harness, and they held Lawrence in place while he locked his carabiners back into the proper rings. He could scarcely breathe yet, but he seized a speaking trumpet and called urgently, All is well! His voice was hardly audible. He pulled in a deep breath and tried again more clearly this time. I am fine, Tamarare. Only keep flying. His tense muscles, the tense muscles beneath them unwound slowly, and Tamarare beat up again, regaining a little of the elevation they had lost. The whole process lasted perhaps 15 minutes. He was shaking as if he had been on deck throughout a three-day gale, and his heart was thundering in his chest. Granby and the midwingmen looked scarcely more composed. Well done, gentlemen. Lawrence said to them as soon as he trusted his voice to remain steady. Let us give Mr. Fellows room to work. Mr. Granby, be so good as to send up some of Vic send up to Victoriatus's captain and see what assistance we can provide. We must take what precautions we can to keep him from further starts. They, ga they gaped at him a moment. Granby was the first to recover his wits and began issuing orders. They're just stunned at how quickly Lawrence recovered from nearly falling off his dragon and dying, you know. By the time Lawrence had made his way very cautiously back to his post at the base of Tamarare's neck, the midwingmen were wrapping Victoriatus's claws with bandages to prevent them from scratching Tamarare again, and Maximus was coming into sight at a distance, hurrying to their assistance. The rest of the flight was relatively uneventful. If the effort involved in supporting a nearly unconscious dragon through the air were ever to be considered ordinary, as soon as they landed Victoriatus safely in the courtyard, the surgeons came hurrying to see both him and Tamarare. To Lawrence's great relief, the cuts indeed uh, proved quite shallow. They were cleaned and inspected, pronounced minor, and loose pad placed over them to keep the torn hide from being irritated. Then Tamarare was set loose, and Lawrence told to let him sleep as and eat as much as he liked for a week. They made it. It was not the most pleasant way to win a few days of liberty, but the respite was infinitely welcome. Lawrence immediately talked, walked Tamarare to an open clearing near the covert, not wanting to strain him by another leap aloft. Through the clearing, though the clearing was upon the mountain, it was relatively level and covered in soft green grass. It faced south, and the sun came into it nearly the entire day. There were two of them. There the two of them slept together from that afternoon until late in the next. Lawrence stretched out upon Tamarare's warm back until hunger woke them both. I feel much better. I am sure I can hunt quite normally, Tamarare said. Lawrence would not hear of it. He walked back up to the workshops and roused the ground crew instead. 
Very shortly, they had driven a small group of cattle up from the pens and slaughtered them. Tamarare devoured every last scrap and fell directly back to sleep. What a hero. What a hero of a dragon, huh? Lawrence, a little di uh, diffidently, asked Holland to arrange for the servants to bring him some food. It was enough to ask the re it was it was enough like asking the man for a personal service to make Lawrence uncomfortable, but he was reluctant to leave Tamarare. Holland took no offense, but when he returned, Lieutenant Granby was with him, along with Riggs and a couple of the other lieutenants. You should go and have something hot to eat and a bath. And, and then sleep in your own bed, Granby said quietly, having waved the others off a little distance. You are all over blood, and it is not warm enough yet for you to sleep outside without risk to your health. I and the other officers will take it in turns to stay with him. We will fetch you once he once, uh, we'll fetch you at once if he wakes, or if any change should occur. Lawrence blinked and looked down at himself. He had not even noticed that his clothes were spattered and streaked with the near black of dragon blood. He ran a hand over his unshaven face. He was clearly presenting a rather horrible picture to the world. He looked up at Temeraire. The dragon was completely unaware of his surroundings, sides rising and falling with a low, steady rumble. I dare say you're right. Very well, and thank you, he added. Granby nodded, and with a last look up at the sleeping Temeraire, Lawrence took himself back to the castle. Now that it had been brought to mind, the sensation of dirt and sweat was unpleasant upon his skin. He had gotten soft with the luxury of daily bathing at hand, unlike on ships where you can't always do that. He stopped by his room only long enough to exchange his stained clothes for fresh and went straight to the baths. It was shortly after dinner and many of the officers had a habit of bathing at this hour. After Lawrence had taken a quick plunge into the pool, he found the sweating room very crowded. But as he came in, several fellows made room for him. He gladly took the open place and returned the nods of greeting around the room before he laid himself down. He was so tired that it only occurred to him after his eyes were closed in the blissful heat of the, uh, that the attention had been unusual and marked. He sat up again with surprise. Well flown, very well flown, Captain, Solari Solaritas told him that evening, approvingly, when he belatedly came to report. No, you need not apologize for being tardy. Lieutenant Granby has given me a preliminary account, and with Captain Berkeley's report, I know well enough what happened. We prefer a captain be more concerned for his dragon than for our bureaucracy. I trust Tamarare is doing well? Thank you, sir. Yes, he said gratefully. The surgeons have told me there is no cause for alarm, and he says he is quite comfortable. Have you any duties for me during his recovery? Nothing other than to keep him occupied. But you may find enough of a challenge, Solaritas said with a snort that passed for a chuckle with him. <laughs> well, that is not quite true. I do have one task for you. Once Tamarer is recovered, you and Maximus will be joining Lily's formation straight away. We have had nothing but bad news from the war, and the latest is worse. Villeneuve and his fleet have slipped out of Toulon under cover of an aerial raid against Nelson's fleet. We have lost track of them. Under the circumstances, and given this lost week, we cannot wait any longer. Therefore, it is time to assign your flight crew, and I would like your requests. Consider the men who have served with you these last weeks, and we will discuss the matter tomorrow. Lawrence walked slowly back out of the clearing after, after this, deep in thought. He had begged a tent from the ground crews and brought along a blanket. He thought he would be quite comfortable once he had pitched it by Temeraire's side. He liked the idea better than spending the whole night away. He found Temeraire still sleeping peacefully, the flesh around the bandage area all, all only ordinarily warm to the touch. Having, sighed, having, having satisfied himself to, on this point, Lawrence said, A word with you, Mr. Granby. He led the lieutenant some short distance away. So Leritas has asked me to name my officers, he said, looking steadily at Granby. The young man flushed and looked down. Lawrence continued, I will not put you in the position of refusing a post. I do not know what that means in the Corps, but I know that in the Navy it would be a serious mark against you. If you would have the least objection, speak frankly. That will be an end to the matter. Sir, Granby began, then shut his mouth abruptly, looking mortified. He had used the term so often in veiled insolence. He started over again. Captain, I am well aware that I have done little enough to deserve such consideration. 
I can only say that if you are willing to overlook the, my, what my past behavior has been, I would be very glad of the opportunity. His speech was a little stilted in his mouth, as if he had tried to rehearse it. Lawrence nodded, satisfied. His decision had been a near thing. If it had not been for Tamarare's sake, he was not sure he could have borne to thus expose himself to a man who had behaved disrespectfully towards him, despite Granby's recent heroics. But Granby was so clearly the best of the lot that Lawrence had decided to take the risk. Good for you, Lawrence. He was well pleased with the reply. It was fair enough and respectful, even if awkwardly delivered. Hey, public speaking of any kind, of any size, you know, not always somebody's forte. Very good, he said simply. They had just begun walking back when Granby suddenly said, Oh, damn it, I may not have been able to word it properly, but I cannot just leave things at that. I have to tell you how very sorry I am. I know I've been playing the scrub. Lawrence was surprised by his frankness, but not displeased. He could never have refused an apology offered with so much sincerity and feeling as was obvious in Granby's tone. I'm very happy to accept your apology, he said quietly, but with real warmth. For my part, all is forgiven, I assure you and I hope that henceforth we may be better comrades than we have been. They stopped, shook hands. Granby looked both relieved and happy, and when Lawrence tentatively inquired for his recommendations for other officers, he answered with great enthusiasm as they made their way back towards Tamarare's side. And there we go, folks. Chapter 7 just made it. I have to run to an appointment, but we got there, didn't we? And we are on to Chapter 8. Please subscribe. Drop me a comment if you haven't already. Always love to meet who's uh, reading through the book with me. And I will see you on the next chapter, chapter 8.